There isn't going to be a welcome to this video, nor will we have an introduction. Instead, we'll be jumping right into setting up the needed software and transferring the needed ROM sets so you can play all of your favorite two-button arcade and console games on your arcade 1UP Simpsons arcade cabinet. This video is for educational purposes only and is only intended to show you what I've done and what my results are. If you choose to modify your systems using this or any other information I've provided from any videos or content I've created, you do so at your own risk. I, this channel, or any person connected to this video will not be held liable for any choices you make with your hardware or software. Modify at your own risk. This guide assumes that you've done the four-player control fix known as the Mystery Dawson Experience. If you haven't, please check out the video linked above and in the description. You must install the control fix if you wish to use all four-player controls with third-party apps like Dig and RetroArch. In short, this guide will not work if you haven't installed it. I would also recommend that you check out the video regarding the Arcade 1UP battery bug. Again, I'll place a link above and in the description. Basically, this is what I've done to all of my modified cabinets, and it's kept the low battery bug at bay, and it may be helpful to you. This guide will also assume that you have a wireless keyboard and mouse combo and an SD card. Keep in mind that the size of the SD card you pick will be indicative of the number of games you can add to your system. In other words, the larger the SD card, the more games from different consoles and arcades you can add. I do recommend that if you do get a large SD card, you try to get a card rated as a free U card. If you're in the market for a keyboard and mouse combo or SD card, please feel free to use the Amazon affiliate links in the description. Not only will you be helping support this fine channel, but you'll also have the confidence to know you've got the right parts. With all of that out of the way, we can get started. The very first thing we'll need to do is remove the back of our arcade cab, and we'll need to insert our SD card and our wireless keyboard and mouse combo. I do wish to point out that my cab does have a powered USB hub, as part of the power modification I did in order to fight the low battery bug. For convenience, I forwarded this hub to the front of my cab for easier access. The first thing we need to do is gain access to the Android operating system. To do this, we'll first take our keyboard and press the Windows key and the letter N, both at the same time. When we do this action, a submenu will open up for us. And if we expand that submenu, we can gain access to the settings menu. From this settings menu, we need to navigate to the storage icon and open it. When we are in the storage area, we'll need to navigate to the top right corner of the screen and click on the three dots. These dots will then open into a new menu, and we'll need to navigate to the bottom of this menu and select storage settings. This will again open up another new menu, and you'll be provided with two main options, format or format as internal. I'll be picking the first option, as I wish to remove my SD card to add more games in the future. Once your SD card has been prepared, simply hit done, then eject your SD card from the cabinet, and we'll need to move over to a PC so we can transfer our APKs, our needed ROM sets, and the rest of our related files. When you're at your PC, you'll need to take a look at the Google Drive link in the description of this video. It will be highlighted with the name Helpful Files. On this Google Drive, you'll find a number of items. The item that you need is a .7z file, or simply put, a zip file called Simpsons RetroArch Base SD Root.7z. Regardless, this zip file has a number of items we'll need, and we'll need to place all of these files on the root of our SD card. Please make sure you download this file. The amount of time it takes will depend on the speed of your computer and your connection. I've, of course, pre-downloaded this file and my ROM sets in order to save time for this video. Regardless, once you've gotten your zipped files downloaded, please extract them into an easy-to-find folder on your desktop. The zip file will have four folders and a readme file. Of the four folders, you'll have a folder named APK files, a folder named BIOS, one for your DIG files, and one for your NOVA files. I'd also like to point out that you'll find four APK files inside your APK files folder, and these files seem to be the best versions of each, and they all seem to work well with one another. The BIOS folder holds the BIOS files of many two-button consoles, and RetroArch will be able to fully support those emulator cores if we include those in our build. We'll also use the images in the Nova and Dig folders, and these images and icons will help give the software the same look and feel as the outside of our cab. We'll also need to add our ROMs to the root of the SD card. I'm unable to provide those to you. 
however, I believe I'm safe in saying that I found my ROM sets on the great archive of the internet. For this DIY guide, I won't be going into ROM overload, but I will be adding 4 ROM sets. Those 4 ROM sets will be Final Burn Alpha, Main 2003 Plus, Nintendo Game Boy, and to top it off, I'll draw a classic from my childhood, the Nintendo NES. We'll need to place the ROMs folder with our other 4 software folders, and when ready, we can insert our SD card into our PC and copy all of the folders into the root of the SD card. This will take some time. How much will depend on the speed of your computer and the quality of the SD card. For me, transferring the files took about 5 minutes, and I'll be fast forwarding that so that it is much shorter for you. If you'd like, you could return the favor by hitting that like button, and if you've not done so yet, hit that subscribe and notification button at the same time. What could it hurt? Besides, those are just small clicks for you, but they mean the world to this small channel. Thank you. We now have all the files, programs, and ROM sets that we'll need on our SD card. We'll now need to eject our SD card from our computer, and we'll need to reinsert our SD card into our Simpsons cab. I also feel the need to state that this will be different than our last few mods, as I'll be keeping this SD card inside my arcade cabinet, as the internal storage on these cabinets is lacking. As you can now see, we have no APK or any software running other than the previously mentioned 4-player fix by Team Encoder known as the Mystery Dawson Experience. The stock software has been connected to Wi-Fi, and all updates have been run. You can even see the online stats of different players on the leaderboard. We'll again press the Windows key and the letter N. This action, again, will give us our sub-window, where we'll grab the center and pull down, letting us connect with the settings option. After connecting with the setting option, navigate to the storage icon and obtain access to the SD card. We'll now need to open the folder that's named APK files, and we'll need to install each of the APK files. I also want to point out that it isn't important in what order you install these programs. However, it is very important to get RetroArch set up and in good working order before you set up DIG. With that said, let's install each program one at a time, and when we're done, we'll configure each app so that it runs as one. After getting each APK installed, we'll navigate to the Apps and Notifications section, click on the selection for default apps, and set Nova as our default home app. After selecting Nova as the default home app, Nova will present itself to be set up and it will start with some of its basic Android options. In this section, we'll need to deselect as many options as we can. Basically, we'll be looking to make this as much like a factory arcade as possible, and we're going to remove as many of the apps from the home screen as we can. Don't miss the center bottom option. Make sure to mark it as none, and when done, click on the red check mark at the bottom right side of the menu. After doing the basic setup in Nova, we'll be kicked back out into the stock arcade 1UP home app. Once here, we'll need to enter the Android software by again hitting Windows and the letter N at the same time. This will get us back into the sub-menu, and from here we can open Nova and finish setting up our home app options. We'll need to delete the two default icons. One is for Nova, and the other will be for the gallery. Once done, we can click and hold anywhere on the home screen, and we'll be presented with an option to change the image of the home screen. I'll be using a simple home screen with images of our stock arcade, RetroArch, and the front-end dig. We'll also be using this image for both the home and the lock screen. Not that I think that really matters. Next, we need to place icons on our home screen and program them with actions. To do this, we'll again click and hold anywhere on the home screen, and we'll be presented with the Nova submenu. In this submenu, we'll need to grab the center tab and use it to open our options. We'll then need to grab the action icon and drop it in the center. After it's been dropped, Nova will need to be told what app corresponds to the icon. We've placed the action icon in the center, and because the image of RetroArch is also in the center, I'll scroll to the bottom of the list, and we'll select RetroArch as the corresponding app. Make sure you use the first action item under RetroArch, listed as the main activity. In order to proceed with our next task, we will once again need to press and hold our mouse button anywhere on our home screen. By carrying out this action, we will once more be granted access to the Nova submenu. Once we have navigated to the Nova submenu, we will need to select the action icon and then place it at the bottom of the Simpsons arcade cabinet. 
After it has been positioned, the icon will ask to be connected to a specific application. It is essential that we choose the One Up app. However, we will want to change the name from One Up to something more understandable, such as Simpsons Arcade, and we will want to change the icon to something that people will understand, such as the image of the Simpsons Arcade cabinet. Both of these changes will need to be made. After you have selected the app that corresponds to it, changed the name, and changed the image, you will need to unclick the reshape button and then click the done button. This should result in an icon that has a pleasing visual appearance. We will also need to replicate these steps for the dig front end. First, we will click and hold down anywhere on the home screen. Again, this action will give us the Nova submenu. At the Nova submenu, we'll need to grab the action icon and drop it in place. Once the icon is in place, we'll select the Dig app, and we'll need to make sure we select the Dig main activity. You will notice that both Dig and RetroArch both come with an image, and we'll not have to select an image to use as an icon, nor will we have to change any names, nor will we need to reshape. Both of these apps are designed for standard app deployment. Now that we have Nova, our home app setup, and the player side navigation of our app setup, let's start setting up RetroArch. If you recall earlier, I said the order in which we set up our apps matters. Well, we want to set up RetroArch first, and then when we set up the front end dig, it will pull some of the configuration files from RetroArch. So, if we get RetroArch configured first, dig will pull the correct files from RetroArch the very first time. It is also important to note that with the basic Mystery Dawson 4 player control fix, the red controls, or player 1 controls, are the only player control set that can be bound with the live key. Because I've done the Mystery Dawson 4 player control fix and because we're using a pre-configured copy of RetroArch, we'll only need to do a little configuring. First, we'll start by disabling the on-screen displays. We're given three options that we can toggle on and off. I'll be turning all of them off, however, you may wish to keep notifications turned on. Regardless, I don't want to see the default game control overlay when playing games. The next important setting we need to edit is telling RetroArch where we've placed our BIOS files. In short, we'll need to select the appropriate directory for those files by navigating to the root of our SD card and informing RetroArch of where our BIOS folder is. Look for an option that says, use this directory, as it seems like a reasonable selection. We'll next need to set up a combination of controller keys to press that will let us exit the game ROM and the RetroArch platform, and then let our front-end dig take over. This sounds like a lot, but in reality we'll just navigate to the input section, then a sub-menu called hotkeys, and when we have the section that is labeled quick controller combo, we'll select it and tell RetroArch that we wish to use the start and select buttons being pressed at the same time to exit. Still in the input section, we'll need to navigate to a submenu called Port 1 Controls, and I'm going to set up my Player 1 controls. I'll be using the automated system that comes with RetroArch. However, I don't believe you have to do this. I think what really needs to happen here is programming the select and start keys. That said, I did everything just to be safe. In addition, I believe that it is essential to emphasize the fact that I did not configure any of the other player controls in the game. Only Player 1. Programming with the auto system does take some time, so we'll be fast forwarding this part. As we wait, please consider helping this channel grow by liking, hitting subscribe, and maybe even sharing this video with a friend. Thank you. Now that we've programmed all of the player one controls, we'll need to navigate to the quick retroarch selection. This is important because it not only exits the app, but exiting in this way will also save our settings. We'll now start Dig and set it up to work as a front end for our games and emulator selection. Dig will use the settings in RetroArch as the default controls in gameplay. However, we'll need to set up ROM folders and menu options. When Dig starts for the first time, it will automatically ask if you'd like to look for ROM files. I simply tell Dig that we'll do that later. However, if you wish, you can start now. It shouldn't hurt anything. Generally speaking, in my limited workings with Dig, I've found that manually scanning my ROMs folder seems to work well with Dig. However, I have found that I do need to restart the app and even the arcade cabinet itself, before a ROM list will fully generate. Just practice the patience of a Jedi, and you should be fine. Under the section called, ROM scanning, I'll also be turning on the automatically scan your device for game folders option. 
Next, we'll move to the app section in our options menu and enable the auto start dig on device boot option. This will make dig start up as soon as our cabinet is booted, giving us access to our game ROMs. If you get kicked out of the dig app, simply navigate back to the app and you'll find yourself back at the dig menu. From here, we'll need to start setting up the menus and backgrounds. As you can see, so far Dig has only found one ROM set. This is normal, don't worry. It takes time. Because it's here, I'll go ahead and show you how to assign an icon to this system. Basically you'll click and hold the default icon. This action will give you a submenu, and you'll need to click on the first option that corresponds to selecting a custom image. We'll then need to navigate to the Dig Stuff folder and find the custom console folder. Once here, select the icon that says Arcade FBA 2012. Not all of the ROM sets have been listed yet, so let's move to the system menus. The first icon we'll need to assign in this section will be that of All Systems. Again, we'll click and hold down the icon correlating to the All Systems icon until we're given a submenu that will give us the option to assign an icon. When we have this option, simply navigate to the Dig folder, then the Main Menu folder, and then select the Custom All Systems icon. I do want to point out that this is best done in grid view. You'll wish to repeat this action until each of the menu icons has been replaced with one of the Simpsons custom icons. I will once again forward this section, as it does take time, and in the future, if I'm able to figure out how to build a custom theme that you can install in one step, I'll be sure to make a video about it. Until then, I'm stuck showing you this. Also, remember to help me grow. If you do, I can make more fun content. Next, we'll navigate to the area for editing the theme. Here we'll scroll down to the section labeled as background, and we'll set a very low transparency value to it. I've got to admit, I'm not sure why this is required, but it is, and so it must be done. I also wish to add a folder that has a few backgrounds that Dig can utilize. To do this, I'll scroll back up to the background images, select the folder option, and I'll inform Dig where that folder is located. I'll be doing the same for the background sounds, and for those of you with a sharp eye, you'll see that I've made a small mistake and used my background sounds folder for both the sounds and the images. Past me will fix this when he sees it. You and future me see this now because we have the power of hindsight, and that is always 2020. Past me now sees that I have no background images, and past me is thinking to himself, what the fudge. I see my error quickly, and I know I need to fix it, but before it will let me fix it, I must change the value in that field to none. Then I can again change it back to folder, and this time I'll be sure to select the right background folder. We'll now save our settings, and we should have a custom background in place. We'll be looking sexy again, just like we did in high school. We also need to inform Dig of the icon placement. I personally like how the wheel looks, so that will be the option I pick. In truth, this is all custom, and you can do whatever it is you personally wish. As you can see, our front-end Dig has only listed one ROM set, and that set is Final Burn Alpha. I do have three more, and I've got to admit that listing the ROM sets does take time and a few restarts of the app and my arcade cabinet. I'll do my best to shield you from the restarting of the app and the cab, as I'm sure you all get the concept. For those of you that don't, basically, I just scanned for ROMs, and each time Dig got hung up, I restarted it, and if that didn't work, I restarted my arcade. As we wait, we can set up the other ROM set icons and get everything ready. I do happen to have two arcade sets, and I'll need to divide these into sections or separate systems. This action is accomplished through a system of cloning, not in a genetic way but in a digital way. Basically, we'll tell Dig to see those ROM sets as different systems. This will let Dig use the sets as different systems, and we'll be able to use the right emulator for the right ROM set. Managing these icons and menus is also best done in grid format. We'll change them back once we're done setting up our small list of icons. I do want to point out that we'll only need to clone the second set of arcade ROMs, as I only have one Game Boy and one NES set. 
If you had something like Game Boy hacks, you may want to separate those from your standard games. You would do that with the cloning option. I'll also be changing the name from Clone of Arcade to the kind of arcade ROM set we have. In this case, we'll call it Main 2003 Plus, as that is the set these ROMs are from. We'll also want to replace the default icon with our clean custom MAME icon. To make this possible, we'll click on the MAME icon and hold it until we're presented with the option to select the custom image for MAME in our console icon folder. I'll now enter the MAME section, and I'll click on the three dots at the top right side of the screen. I'll then scroll to the bottom of the menu and open the submenu called Manage Systems, and I'll select the ROM Path option. After making our selection, we'll be given the opportunity to tell DIG where to find the right ROM set for MAME. We simply navigate to the section called MAME 2003 Plus and let DIG know the ROMs can be found there. I also don't think it will hurt if I tell the system to scan this clone for ROMs again. So we'll do that just to be safe. The Nintendo Entertainment System, also known as the NES, and the Nintendo Game Boy are the company's respective handheld and classic 8-bit video game consoles, respectively. Both were favorites of mine when I was a kid, and both of them will need to have custom icons added for them. Additionally, I will set the ROM paths for both of them just to be safe. In truth, I don't think the ROM paths for these two are needed, but make sure you set them up for both our arcade sets. We now have icons for each of our menu items, and for each of our ROM sets, let's leave our dig front end to scan for ROMs and turn our attention to button mapper. We'll use this app to return ourselves to the home screen. In reality, every program we've added so far will let you back out and exit to the home app. However, the stock Simpsons Arcade software doesn't have this functionality built in, and we'll need to supplement the stock software capabilities with Button Mapper's abilities. After navigating Button Mapper to the Open Settings tab, we'll click that tab and turn on Button Mapper's services. When doing this, we'll also have to click on the Allow button, giving Button Mapper full control of our arcade. Next, we need to click on the Add button option, and we'll be taken to a new screen with a blue plus sign. Click on that, and then tap your live button. We'll be asked if we'd like the pro features. Just say no, thank you, and turn on customize. After that, select double tap or long press. This part is really up to you. What's important is that after you've made your selection, you'll need to select the home option. If you don't, then you can't exit the Simpsons app. Just saying. After a few restarts of my arcade cab, I now have three systems listed, and spoiler alert, it will soon be four systems. Final Burn Alpha, Main, Game Boy, and the NES. These four sets will populate given time, and we will have all of our games, but do any of you know what step I forgot? If you don't, don't worry, as I'm going to remedy my forgetful behavior by making the needed changes. For those of you who see my error and know I've not downloaded any emulator cores, well done. To fix my error, I'll download every core for every system that I have. In other words, I'll download all the Final Burn Alpha, all the Main 2003, all the NES cores, and I'll do the same with the Game Boy cores. It really is a simple fix, but I should have done this when setting up RetroArch. That's my bad, that one is on me. I'm really happy that this doesn't affect any of the controller configuration files that DIG uses to set itself up. It would have sucked if I had to do this twice. We'll now need to configure DIG so that it knows what emulator core to request from RetroArch when we make a game selection. This is done by first selecting a system like Final Burn Alpha. Then click the three dots in the top right corner and click on the Manage System option at the bottom of that menu. I'll then select the RetroArch core and change it to the one I wish to use as the default. I'll then also change the default RetroArch version to the 32-bit core. This will need to be done to each of our systems. Well, that's about it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. If you did, or even if you didn't, please consider supporting this channel by liking this video, leaving me a nice comment under the description, subscribing, and sharing this video on your social media. These are all just small clicks of the mouse for you, but to this channel, they mean the world. Thank you.